Have you ever stood on the edge of a swimming pool and looked down at the water? If you stand right at the edge, you can peer over the brink and look straight down to the bottom. You can even lean forward a bit too, and barring some outside force, you can spring back and avoid falling in. You can lean even further if you dare and test your luck, and if you don't slip, you might just sneak away without getting wet. But how far can you go before gravity takes over? If you tempt fate, how much can you press against the brink before you can no longer go back? This precarious little game is one our leaders played time and time again during the heady days of the Cold War, constantly provoking their international counterparts in an infernal game of chicken. The Soviets and the Americans built nukes in as many forms as they could, funded the exponential expansion of military technology, and seized as much territory and as many resources as possible during the years of 1946 and 1991. Nearly half a century of pushing, prodding jackassery that threatened to end the world in literal minutes for the entirety of the war. Call it brinksmanship, mutually assured destruction, doomsday theory, apocalypse by any other name. In October of 1962, the world stood closer to that edge than it ever had during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The pesky Russians were trying to put nukes in Cuba, right in America's backyard. Khrushchev and Kennedy barked, but neither one bit. And the world sighed in relief when both powers reached a shaky peace. But the edge was always there, and both countries continued to tiptoe around its fiery borders. Even through the world-shaking events of the mid-century, when it was easier to ignore the bombs, the U.S. and U.S.S.R. never stopped playing with fire, and in 1983, both countries would lean over the edge again, putting the world on the line and taking us closer to hell than ever before. Imagine a room awash in gasoline, and there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches. The other has 7,000 matches. Each of them is concerned about who's ahead, who's stronger. The reality is that we must find peace through strength. Theoretically, anything could result in a nuclear war if the Soviet Union thought it could win it. I don't think conflict in the world is going to end. I think nuclear conflict, nuclear resolution of conflict, will end the world. We've made proposal after proposal after proposal, as the record shows, and they, they've just been rejecting, sidestepping it, making excuses. The march of freedom and democracy, which will leave Marxism, Leninism on the ash heap of history as it has left other tyrannies, which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. In 1981, the world was facing some pretty massive cast changes on the world stage. President Jimmy Carter had left the White House in January, handing the reins over to a man we've already met on this channel, Ronald Reagan. I mentioned in the past that Reagan had postured himself as a tough, unrelenting force against communism, in stark contrast to Carter, but I fear I might have cast President Peanut in too meek a light. Carter, despite his reputation, actually became quite hawkish in stature toward the end of his presidency. Beginning with Nixon and through the tenure of his successor Gerald Ford, the Soviets in the US had entered a detente with Premier Brezhnev. This period is remembered by many Russians as a sort of golden age. Nuclear tensions relaxed, and both sides entered arms control talks that lowered the global temperature to levels not seen since the immediate post-war period. But this peace wouldn't last, and it would be Carter, of all people, who would begin breaking the detente. <laughs> Toward the end of the 70s, the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan, and even from the beginning, Carter was openly vocal about human rights violations in the Soviet Union. And most concerning of all, the Russians had begun flooding their western borders with intermediate-range ballistic missiles. Oh my God! Something we'll get into in more detail a little later. For these reasons and others, Carter started to dismantle Nixon's detente, increasing defense spending, imposing embargoes on the USSR, shifting American diplomacy toward China, which was a great idea, oh bother. and even pulling back from the SALT II missile treaty. And Russia would respond in turn, loosening the funding valve and pouring a staggering amount of money into their defense budget. And when Reagan took over, he would speed up this process exponentially. 
You see, Reagan was about to do something unheard of for an American politician. He was going to keep a campaign promise. He said he was going to be tough on Russia, and he meant it. Right out of the gate, his administration began the largest peacetime military buildup in the history of the world, increasing our military's ability to strike fast at any Russian aggression. And the rhetoric that would go with this buildup was just as inflammatory as the actual in-theater movements. Reagan made his disdain for the communist system plain from the outset, describing his sincere hope that freedom and democracy would leave Marxism and Leninism on the ash heap of history. What I'm describing now is a plan and a hope for the long term. The march of freedom and democracy which will leave Marxism, Leninism on the ash heap of history as it has left other tyrannies which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. These harsh words would often stand in contrast to Reagan's other passion, peace in his time. Yes, the Gipper would often wax lyrically about his desire to see peaceful relations with the Soviets, having even promised to meet with the Soviets during his first year in office, a campaign promise he would not keep. And I don't think it's fair to assume he was totally lying. Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet ambassador to the US, would succinctly describe the paradox of Ronald Reagan, a man he said saw nothing contradictory about publicly attacking the Soviet Union as the evil empire while writing sincere personal letters to Soviet leadership expressing his desire for a non-nuclear world and better Soviet-American relations. Only, in the early 80s, Reagan believed strongly that peace could only be maintained through strength, something the Russians understood and even respected to some degree. But Reagan's administration didn't stop at military buildups and strong language. 1981 would see the beginning of one of the most frustratingly brash practices the US military ever undertook in the Cold War, the PSYOP. And yes, this time I mean that PSYOP. Come on over here. Come on over here. No, you flip me off. Come on, coward. No, no, no. Come on. You're not an intellectual. You're a fake and a fraud. In 1981, US warships sailed deep into the Greenland Iceland United Kingdom gap in the North Atlantic stealthily approaching depths never before plumbed in the Cold War. From these positions, Navy aircraft even flew simulated bombing runs over Soviet military sites. Jets would storm the Soviet radar lines, appearing as if from nowhere, poking and prodding until the very last minute before disengaging, often after provoking a Russian airborne response. And these actions weren't limited to only one theater. In addition to testing Soviet readiness and radar capability, these PSYOPs were designed to cause fear and paranoia, leaving the Russians constantly on guard, never knowing when and where the US might pop up again. These incursions revealed startling gaps in the Soviets' early warning nets, often by intentionally spoofing ballistic missile detection systems. And it worked. By the end of 1981, the Soviets were certain the US would attack them, and they would do everything in their power to prepare for such an event. In 1982, the aging Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev announced an end to the Soviet Union's attempt to achieve mutual cooperation with the US, stating that peace was not for the asking with the imperialists, Must crush capitalism. and that it could only be safeguarded by the invincible might of the Soviet armed forces. In a matter of a mere few years, the detente was totally ended, and both sides began preparing for war. Soon, Brezhnev would die, leaving the Soviet Union in the hands of the already paranoid Yuri Andropov, a man that Reagan would later express true disdain for. And the feeling was mutual. By 1982, the US had vowed to implement its own intermediate-range nukes in Europe, unless Andropov could agree to a 0-0 deal regarding IRBMs. But what was the big deal with these weapons? Why, in a world where ICBMs could reach either capital in 15 minutes, would it matter that a few more sat on the Russian border? Well, it was all about timing, really. In 1982, the Russians were fielding about 300 SS-20 intermediate-range MIRV-capable nuclear missiles. These weapons were pointed at Europe, not the US, and they really upset the balance of power on the continent. The reason for this imbalance was the speed at which they could reach their targets. At launch, any target in Europe could be hit in as little as five minutes, leaving almost no time for a counterattack, and very little breathing room for governments on the continent. This was thought to be necessary for the Soviets, as, from their point of view, the US, an entire ocean away, was a sort of untenable trump card at the nuclear war table, 
and the fast-acting SS-20s would make America think twice about a first strike if they knew they couldn't save Europe. The US knew this too, but they weren't about to let the Soviets maintain this weapons gap. Their answers to them came in the form of the Pershing-2 IRBM and the Griffin nuclear cruise missile. The Pershing could hit Moscow in as little as five minutes, and the Griffin, while taking much longer to get there, could do it almost undetectably. And apart from some minor tactical aims, that would be the only purpose of these missiles had they been deployed in 1982, as they couldn't actually reach the Soviet ICBM silos in Kazakhstan. To the Soviets, the US IRBMs had only one goal, the decapitation strike. Decapitation! In nuclear war parlance, the decapitation strike is what both sides feared most. A surprise attack against the military and civilian heads of either country that would render whichever side totally unable to respond and defend against invasion. And in the 1980s, neither side had a reasonable defense against such an attack. For the Soviets, their only contingency would have been to retreat underground into vast tunnel networks where, it was hoped, the Politburo might survive to lead the fight. But every Russian official knew that this was a pipe dream and that likely the only leaders the USSR would have would be the ones that weren't in Moscow at the time. Likewise, the US had plans to whisk the president into the sky and command the war from the always airborne EC-135 looking glass, a converted KC-135 of B-52 refueling fame. But again, they knew that this was likely not to work, and that just like the Soviets, America's leaders during a nuclear war would be whoever didn't get vaporized in the opening salvo. They knew it probably wouldn't be the president, whoever it was. This is the bummer, man. Even with all of this knowledge standing plainly and open for the taking, the US did not consider the threat of their IRBMs to be over the top. Just like every other arms race thus far, they would have to respond in strength to any Soviet gap. And so Reagan insisted on the zero zero deal, despite everyone knowing the Soviets would not, and in their view, could not agree to it. It was over six years ago, November 18th, 1981, when I first proposed what would come to be called the zero option. It was a simple proposal, one might say disarmingly simple. <laughs> With neither side backing down and the paranoia building fast, the Soviets started to get desperate and would soon initiate one of the largest intelligence operations of the entire Cold War, Operation Ryan. Short for, and please forgive me Russian speakers, Raketno Yadonai Napadinya, or Nuclear Missile Attack, Operation Ryan was a vast interagency intel gathering program designed to suss out an American first strike before it happened, giving the Soviets the best chance to survive and counterattack in the event of a nuclear war. And when I say interagency, this is no throwaway line. The KGB would team up with their rivals, the GRU, for the first time in decades, ending the long-held silence between the two factions, something completely unprecedented but for the extreme importance of the mission. Operation Ryan was a classic Soviet espionage action, relying on the Russians' penchant for human intelligence in the face of America's sophisticated signals intelligence. In simpler terms, the Americans watched and listened using technology, while the Russians used real-life double agents and spies to monitor their enemies. Right behind you. The reasons for these different approaches are fascinating, but I'll have to leave them for another video. Suffice it to say, the Russians relied on a vast network of human watchers to provide all kinds of warnings, both obvious and esoteric. Agents were told to watch for things like increased troop movement and the comings and goings of political leaders, particularly the goings. But in addition, they were also told to watch for increased stores and blood banks and even preparations at local churches, any little thing that might hint at a surprise attack. Operation Ryan let loose a flood of intelligence into the Soviet machine, and while it certainly provided the much-needed information they were seeking, it also did much to increase the already spiraling paranoia in the Soviet government. They were sure the US was about to strike, and they would not miss the signs, no matter what. And very soon, the writing would be sprawled all over the proverbial wall. But before we get into the boiling water, let's take a brief look at the fun parts of nuclear annihilation, the armies and weapons. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! In my first World War III video, I discussed the weird and wacky weapons the US Army implemented in its theoretical fight against the USSR in the early 60s. And at the end of that video, I alluded to the idea that Kennedy helped steer America away from the ludicrous notion of tactical nuclear weapons and into the pure deterrence stance that we think we know today. 
And while that is sorta of true from a diplomatic stance, it's really not true at all from a military stance. Certainly not from the Soviet side, and not even really from the American side. In fact, sources from the US Army in the 80s have since reported that a stockpile of 5,000 tactical nukes had been maintained in Europe across the decade. This is a relatively small number compared to the more than 20,000 across the whole US arsenal, but it still represents the will of the US military to respond to conventional attacks with nuclear means. Tactical nukes could include ballistic missiles with smaller payloads, but more fun examples include the W-33 artillery shell, a 5 to 10 kiloton warhead designed for use with the M-115 howitzer. And just like last time, we're talking a near little boy sized bomb on a freaking howitzer. And interestingly enough, just like little boy, the W-33 was a gun type fission device. In addition to preserving nuclear artillery, atomic demolition munitions also survived into the 80s, along with the Honest John rocket, which would continue its service until 1985. Alongside a slew of new surface-to-surface -surface and air-to-surface -surface missiles, all designed with lower yields to fit the tactical role. I went through the early plans for war in Europe in my last World War III video, and sadly, nothing fundamentally changed on either side in the intervening decades. In fact, there is an argument to be made that the plans got even more nuclear, with the US having devoted so much focus to the Vietnam War that had only just wrapped up, and the Soviets doing the same thing in Afghanistan. Due to the shift of troops, supplies, and general focus, both sides would have to rely more heavily on nuclear weapons to even the odds, including the dreaded IRBM. Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! The Russians brought their most well-known IRBM to the table in 1976, the RSD-10 Pioneer, known by NATO as the SS-20. This missile had an effective range of 5,800 kilometers and a max yield of 1.65 megatons. The Pioneer was also capable of carrying three MIRV warheads, each with a 550 kiloton yield. I've talked before about the three levels of nuclear warfare, strategic, operational, and tactical and the SS-20 was capable of contributing to all of them. It could wreck a city with a nearly 2 megaton blast, shut down operational areas with well-placed MIRVs, and it was road mobile and relatively fast to deploy. And of course, she looked great on the parade ground. Hell yeah. Hell yeah! The biggest threat the Pioneer would pose would be blistering speed and fast delivery to NATO targets, with little warning. That 15 minutes started to look like an eternity to the citizens of Western Europe, in the face of the mere five they would get with the Pioneer. Like I mentioned before, the US would soon respond with its own IRBMs. The Pershing II was likewise a road mobile missile, with a range of 1,770 kilometers, carrying a W-85 warhead with a max yield of 80 kilotons. This weapon was much more purpose-built, with a relatively low yield and shorter range. But please keep in mind, we're talking five times bigger than the Hiroshima bomb, so it really wasn't that small. The Pershing II is the first land-based missile designed to hit the Soviet Union from Germany with pinpoint accuracy. We have a vehicle that is capable of surgically striking a target with a minimal damage to outside the target area. This short range was, again, part of the rub for the Soviets, as they saw the limited capabilities of the Pershing II as a clear sign it was meant for a decapitation strike. And they may not have been too off base there as one of the planned roles for the Pershing II would have seen it carrying the W-86, an unrealized bunker-busting nuke, designed to penetrate and crater hard targets, like tunnels. The other arrow in the intermediate quiver of the US was the BGM-109G Griffin cruise missile, a subsonic weapon with a range of 2,780 kilometers and a max yield of 150 kilotons. This missile would pose an even greater threat than the Pershing, as it was difficult to detect with its subsonic speeds and sophisticated guidance systems. And of course, both sides were still sporting enough ICBMs and strategic bombers to flip the board if the ground war went sour. No World War game to date has ever been able to avoid such a conclusion, including the ones that would occur in that seminal year of 1983. So in your discussions of the nuclear freeze proposals, I urge you to beware the temptation of pride, the temptation of blithely uh, declaring yourselves above it all, and label both sides equally at fault, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. 
Reagan's evil empire speech was a political smash. It rallied his base around a near universal distrust of the Soviets. It called them what every American knew them to be, evil. So clear was its focus on morality that in the first draft, the speech would mention evil seven times. Now, it is important to remember who Reagan's audience was for this speech. The National Association of Evangelicals, a very American-style Christian group that really resonated with Reagan's crusader rhetoric. But make no mistake, the speech didn't just cause a row amongst American pundits. It also effectively and finally broke the detente of the past decade, showing the Soviets that America could no longer simply live and let live. At least, that's how the Russians saw it. Again, Reagan would keep them guessing with his public rhetoric, sometimes contradicting his private candor. Nevertheless, Reagan had made it clear that the U.S. was not equal in blame for the Cold War, and that the Russians were, and always had been, the bad guys. The time for diplomacy from equal footing was over, and Reagan would use this age-old dichotomy of good and evil to justify the American deployment of IRBMs. And Russia watched and remained stoic in the face of this move. Just kidding, no they didn't. Instead, they set about arranging and financing vast protests across Europe. In fact, over the three-year period since the IRBM talks began, the Russians spent an estimated $600 million on propaganda, backing protests to put pressure on European nations to block the US deployment of IRBMs. And of course, the speech and the certain deployment of those missiles meant for Russia anyway that a gauntlet had been thrown down, and the already burning conflict had just gotten a little hotter. But all of this would be nothing compared to the gasoline firestorm that was about to erupt. On the afternoon of September 1st, 1983, a Soviet Sukhoi Su-15 fighter jet started tracking an intruder over Russian airspace near Sakhalin Island, north of Japan. The Russian Air Command was in a near constant state of alert, to the point of paranoia. The U.S. PSYOPs, combined with the worsening geopolitical climate, had given birth to a zero-tolerance policy toward the trespassing aircraft. And what was worse, the Soviets had spent the day testing at the Kura missile range in Kamchatka, which attracted the attention of an American RC-135 recon plane. When the Boeing 747, designated Korean Airlines Flight 007, appeared on their radar, the Soviets assumed it was the RC-135 coming back for another peek at their missiles. Only this time, it drifted into restricted airspace. After some tracking and deliberation, the Soviet commander gave the order to intercept Cal 007. The lead pilot let off a warning salvo, but the plane stayed course and began to ascend. Finally, another order came through. Destroy the target. At this point, at least the pilot knew it was a civilian plane. But the Russians believed this could have been an insidious ploy by the Americans to dress military planes like civilian transports. And so the pilot locked on, and the missile flew, hitting its mark and slaying 269 civilians, including one American congressman, Larry McDonald. The destruction of Korean Airlines Flight 007 was a watershed moment in world history. One of those times where every soul with knowledge of the event would wonder at the sheer futility of human life. Nobody knew what would happen next. The Soviet military took American lives, shooting down a civilian aircraft seemingly without provocation. At least, that's how many in the US saw it. To the Soviets, they had intercepted an intruder during one of the tensest periods in their history. And after all, the plane had veered off course without communication, and they claimed the right to protect their borders in whatever way they deemed necessary. Their heightened alert status had caused them to make a mistake. But of course, they weren't about to admit this, and they would attempt to twist and spin and otherwise totally control the narrative from the outset. They claimed they never knew it was a civilian craft, and that Cal 007 didn't have any signal lights on, but none of this was true. For the rest of 1983 and even beyond, the Soviet government took the official stance that despite the obvious evidence, Cal 007 was, in fact, a spy plane sent to probe their defenses. For America's part, the president roundly condemned the Soviets, calling the attack a crime against humanity, and the immediately following diplomatic action would see little headway in terms of peaceful resolution. Armed with justification and righteous indignation, America no longer lacked an excuse to kick off World War III. 
In that most volatile of years, it wouldn't take long for yet another gut-wrenching scare to occur, though this one would not be publicized like the last one was. During the very same month as the destruction of Korean Airlines Flight 007, Soviet Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov was the officer on duty in the Serpukhov 15 early warning bunker near Moscow. Petrov was in charge of a large team of technicians tasked with monitoring Russia's OKO ICBM tracking system. On September 26th, just after midnight, Petrov was alerted to five scintillations on the radar screen, indicating the manifestation of the worst possible scenario. The U.S. had launched ICBMs at the USSR. Petrov was no mere night watchman. He was intimately familiar with the OKO system because he helped design it, specifically the algorithms that helped determine whether a flash of energy was just a burst of photons or an actual incoming missile. As such, Petrov had the last word when it came to the current radar blips. Dozens of other radar bunkers were hanging on the 44-year-old officer's call, and even the higher-ups had been notified. Was this it? Every soul in the bunker knew how hot the world had just become. Everyone knew the U.S. was seething after the loss of Cal 007, and everyone knew that Reagan considered them evil because of it. But Petrov was a rational, cool-headed man. He ordered his men to review the data and troubleshoot their systems. The sirens were blaring, the satellites were definitely seeing something, but was it the real thing? Petrov's desk had a small box with sensors connected to a probability computer, and that computer had determined that probability was high. By every metric and procedure in the book, Petrov's next move was simple. Call it in and begin the counterattack. During this unprecedented moment, Petrov later admitted that he fully believed the Americans would attack Russia. So why didn't he call it in? According to the later interviews, he figured that when the U.S. attacked for real, it would likely be a massive, overwhelming salvo of ICBMs, and at the moment, he was only looking at five. No others had popped up in the intervening minutes, either. So he called into command and reported that no launch had happened. Whatever Oko was seeing, it was not an American attack. This moment is known today as one of the closest calls in all of the Cold War, and it is no coincidence that it happened in 1983. Petrov would have known about American PSYOPs and the tendency to spoof early warning systems. He would have been tense and on edge, having to determine the difference in radar readings that could mean the end of his entire country, or even of all humanity. All of the events, all of the rhetoric, and all of the threats would have been buzzing about the two-story bunker when he made that final call. One of my favorite YouTubers, Imp Lemon, made a video about this incident in which he asserts that there has never been a man more powerful than Stanislav Petrov, and that could be true. But the frightening reality is, there were more incidents that would have carried a similar weight during 1983. How many other Petrov moments had there been? How many trips to the edge would we take before this horrible year would end? When people think of Abel Archer 83, if they do at all, they tend to think of one big silly exercise that happened to take place in 1983. But really, it was just that year's war game, and it wasn't even the only one. Every year, the US military engaged in naval maneuvers, land-based troop movements, and even nuclear war procedures limited to so-called paper exercises. In fact, the president was even expected to take part in these paper exercises, acting out his ultimate duty of commanding a nuclear response from Washington. Disturbingly enough, only two presidents ever took full part in these rehearsals, those being Ike and Jimmy Carter. Reagan, for his part, had expressed a desire to do it, though he was unable to in 1982 because of a campaign rally. You gotta take care of the important stuff, right? Hard to even function with such mystique. Anyway, by the time Able Archer 83 kicked off, the U.S. had already completed Fleet X-83, a Navy maneuver that saw the largest mobilization of the Pacific Fleet since World War II. Three carrier groups took part in a two-week exercise consisting of 23,000 crewmen and 300 aircraft, all within flight range of the Soviet coast. The Soviets themselves had known about Fleet X-83, but they were surprised by the size and scope of it as they watched from their submarines. Next was the massive Autumn Forge 83 exercise, under which six other maneuvers and exercises would take place, including Abel Archer. Amongst the six was Reforger, which was short for Return of Forces to Germany. I mentioned in my last World War III video that after a time, Europe had gotten really sick of having American soldiers all over their countries. And as such, a minimal amount of troops were maintained for reinforcement. 
Reforger was designed to practice mass airlifting of soldiers and equipment to Germany in the event of a Soviet attack, and it would do just that, seeing a staggering 16,000 American soldiers moved across the Atlantic under radio silence, the largest number Reforger had yet seen. To the Soviets, this was not really a shock, as Reforger was another yearly exercise, but there were some firsts this time, apart from the size. Namely, NATO had staged additional forces in the Netherlands and Italy for the first time since World War II, and a C-141 had flown non-stop from the U.S. and dropped 280 Army Rangers into northern Germany under cover of night. All of this action during any other year might have been passed off as routine war games, but this was not any other year, and the worst was yet to come. Able Archer 83 was a command post exercise that was meant to last five days, beginning on paper and culminating in a simulated DEFCON 1 nuclear response drill. During the paper portion, the players followed a scripted sequence of events that saw Warsaw Pact forces pounded by NATO on the German front. The Soviets then attack Great Britain and destroy the B-52 station there, and NATO uses chemical weapons to plug up the Fulda Gap. By the end of the third day, the Soviets had reinforced their lines and, as expected, had broken through NATO forces and began their drive towards the English Channel. Just like every single war game preceding it, Able Archer 83 would go nuclear before too long. The final two days would see an actual real-life rehearsal of a nuclear attack. In this game, it would be the US that would shoot first, in an attempt to repel the Russian ground invasion. The simulated heads of NATO would call for the big ask, that is, permission to use nuclear weapons. The players would then have to wait 12 hours before final permission would return, and at that point, the imaginary bombs would go live. At this point in the exercise, the players at SHAPE headquarters actually put on their MOPP3 radiation safety equipment, and the base actually increased its security posture. This latter happening was of course noticed by Soviet spies, making it abundantly clear to Russia that Able Archer 83 would be different from its predecessors. Hundreds of American radio ops began communicating launch procedures from HQ to the various crypto shacks across Europe. Alarms sounded, troops swarmed, and even the commander of all US forces in Europe left his central command and deployed to a mobile convoy. The Russian reaction was swift and serious. Regiments went on high alert and began mobilizing near the border with West Germany. Half of the IRBM fleet was put on alert status, up from 10% during normal conditions. Soviet ICBM base commanders spent most of their time during Able Archer 83 in their bunkers with their fingers on the keys. If an attack really was happening, they would be ready to respond in an instant. Meanwhile, in the UK, a double agent working for NATO noticed colleagues in his GRU station were working in a panicked frenzy. They had just received a flash telegram from Moscow. It read in more or less words that America may be using Able Archer as a cover for a surprise attack and that all Soviet personnel should watch for signs of an impending strike. Elsewhere in the intelligence community, Warsaw Pact spies communicated with their NATO turncoats yeah, hello, Dimitri. to try and determine the likelihood of attack. During the final day of Able Archer, when NATO was rehearsing nuclear release procedures, the Soviets had been listening as best they could. They had managed, through espionage, to crack some of the most important American codes, but to their surprise, a new code had been implemented just before the exercise began. Some aspects of the code remained the same, but now the Soviets were deaf to the entire message. It was speculated by some that Soviet spies even sent spoof messages to crypto shacks to try and suss out what was going on, causing even more paranoia amongst the underlings at American nuclear facilities. And if all this wasn't enough, another exercise was occurring at the same time as Able Archer, Crysex 83, in which B-52s would practice refueling over Europe. Perfect timing. Live warheads were mated to their missiles, B-52s were crisscrossing the skies, and SLBMs spooled up and went green. To the enlisted US soldiers and to the Russians watching, Able Archer looked like the real deal, and the Soviets stood ready with shaky hands to respond to this posture. But thankfully, nothing happened. Soviet double agents conveyed to their handlers that there were no indicators of war preparation outside of the purview of the exercises. And before long, the bases returned to a normal security stature, though the Soviets would maintain a heightened alert for days after the end of Able Archer 83. Easy, easy, I'm cool, man. And before the final end, there was one more Petrov moment. 
Lieutenant General Perutz, Deputy Chief of the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, was the officer in charge of Able Archer, and his team had been monitoring the Soviet Air Force's escalation in reaction to the exercise. The IRBMs were moving, the whole Soviet alert status had been raised to something like DEFCON 2, and the whole thing was ready to go up at a pin drop. Perutz, like Petrov, should have responded in kind and brought the U.S. Air Force to a similar alert status, but he didn't. The Soviets' posture demanded a response, and in any other circumstance, that's likely what was coming next. But Perut's decision, described by a presidential advisory board as fortuitous if ill-informed, was yet another near-miss moment that could have meant the start of World War III. Abel Archer 83 finished on November 11th, and though the Soviets did not immediately calm down, the temperature could finally start to cool. Able Archer 83 would not be recognized for the watershed moment it was for many, many years. In the immediate aftermath, most of America's leaders dismissed the Soviets' concerns as posturing and political acting. How could the bad guys actually be afraid of us? And that's no rhetorical question, to be sure. Many Americans, civilians or otherwise, could not conceive of Russian fear in the face of American arms buildup. Perhaps they really were faking it. I mean, it was only an exercise after all, and the Russians had much to gain from painting the US as aggressive warmongers. They really, really didn't want those IRBMs to be deployed, and feigning deep concern over Abel Archer would have helped to shine a sympathetic light on the as-yet vilified Soviets. This view may be bolstered, too, by the fact that in early 1984, Reagan's White House was flooded with letters written by Soviet civilians, begging the president not to, uh, nuke them and stuff. Were these sincere petitions from your everyday Russian, or just manufactured sentimentalities meant to sway the U.S. government? It's hard to say. Some writers point to the rather unconcerned memoirs written by Soviet and American officials as evidence that Abel Archer was never a big deal and that the Soviets were merely manufacturing concern over the IRBM debacle. But many of these interviews cited were taken in the late 80s, as in during the ongoing Cold War, and Ronald Reagan's presidency for that matter. So you could see why they wouldn't want to paint their actions as overtly aggressive. And as for the Soviets, most of the writing I've read about their dissenting opinions is in regards to Operation Ryan in the espionage community. And speaking of which, it does make sense to lean on Soviet spies if you doubt the severity of the war scare. Despite the glut of information coming in from Project Ryan, the Warsaw Pact spies seemed to be the only ones with their heads on straight in 1983. Much of the paranoia surrounding Abel Archer was dispelled by the studious work of particularly East German spies, so if you just looked at their actions, you'd probably think there was never any danger at all. But you have to put the words and actions of those few against the posture and paranoia of the great many that threatened to push the world into war during that year. The Russians did raise their alert status, they did mobilize half their IRBMs, and they did send out warnings to their foreign agents. On the other side, one could easily see how the actions of the United States military could drive a country to such a guarded status. Between the psyops, buildups, troop movements, and aggressive rhetoric, what else could we have honestly expected? The Soviets had long expressed fears internally that the U.S. would cloak an attack under the guise of a war game, and with the unprecedented maneuvers coming from the various exercises in 1983, they felt it had never been more likely. Couple that with the rising tensions and monumentous occasions like Korean Airlines Flight 007, and you have a recipe for accidental disaster. So yes, of course the Russians were afraid of us. And don't forget, we almost went to war over the USSR putting missiles in Cuba back in 1962. And at the time, the US already had nuclear weapons in Europe, at a similar distance as the dreaded Cuban missiles might have been from mainland America. Does it not make sense that Russia would object to fast, nearly undetectable missiles in their backyard? Now, to be clear, and I hope after my previous videos that this is pretty obvious, I am no Soviet sympathizer, so I'm not trying to make some kind of political point here. And I also know that psyops and buildups could have had an effect on the outcome of the war. I spent a lot of time going over this point in my SDI video, and there is no doubt that the Soviets started spending tons of money on defense once Reagan took office, with some estimating as much as 90% of their GDP going toward military spending. There can be little doubt that the Soviets contributed to their own downfall with all of this aggressive spending, but the potential cost of pushing this behavior was actual apocalypse, 
So yeah, I guess you can judge for yourself if it was truly worth it. Especially when you consider that the USSR was likely headed for the same end regardless of the escalation, thanks to corruption and, you know, communism. As you can see, our situation is shockingly grim. Reagan's response to the reports from Abel Archer were rather dismissive at first, but due to a combination of factors, the aggressive Gipper would start to soften quite a bit. Seeing the boiling point get so close, and realizing, if begrudgingly, that the Russians might actually be afraid of us, had an effect on the man. He began to fear the futility of nuclear war, so much so that he set the defense industry on a wacky path of anti-missile defense, space weapons, and of course, lasers. Also, Reagan was influenced by a certain movie that had come out that November. Once 1983 wrapped up, it only took two months for Andropov to die, and after a brief and relatively uneventful premiership from Konstantin Chernenko, Mikhail Gorbachev took the reins in 1985. Gorbachev and Reagan began the most effective thaw of the Cold War, and through negotiations and diplomacy, the world never again returned to that brink. At least, not while the USSR still stood. So we didn't get wet in 1983. Thanks to some level-headed decision-making by men closer to the ground, the world stepped back yet again. But make no mistake, despite the end of the Cold War, despite the fall of the USSR, and despite all of the arms reduction treaties, the edge still exists. That's the hell of a nuclear world. They will always be with us. They will never go away. We live in a world where any conflict might escalate to nuclear war. So the only question left is, when will we stand by that edge again? Thank you everybody for watching, and I'm so sorry it took me so long to make this video. Uh, if anybody's wondering why it might have taken so long, it's because of this! Yes, uh, my wife and I are pregnant. We're having a baby, uh, should be here in December, so uh, I've had to do a whole lot more work around the house, a whole lot more work for my regular jobs, and it's just kind of gotten in the way of doing all these videos. I. By no means I'm going to stop. I want to continue to make these for as long as I'm able, but it might just be a little slower in coming than usual. So uh, look out for some more Doomed to Rewind videos. Those should be coming soon because they're a lot easier for me to make. And uh, I want to do another Broken Arrow on the Iceland nope. uh, B-52 crash. I think that would be really cool. Um, or Greenland, I think, is what it was. Whatever it was, I'll research it and then I'll tell you. So anyway, thank you so much for watching and I can't wait to make more videos. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, that's it. Bye.